All right, everyone. Well, it is 12.02, so we will go ahead and get started. Thanks again for being here. This is the second round of the EEN Book Club, and it is just a joy to be on Zoom with everyone again. So hello to the new people who have joined our book club, and welcome back to those who came back for another hopefully great experience. So I will turn it over to Beth, who will kick us off with a word of prayer and introduce our discussion for the day. Take it away, Beth. Thanks, Tori. It's so good to be back with everyone. I see a lot of faces I recognize from the last go round and I'm really excited to have everybody here as we start a new book. Um, and uh, we're really excited about kicking off today because we're going to set the tone for the book club. We're going to set the reasons why we're doing this book and um, we're going to have an interesting conversation with Ben Lowe and uh, Mitch Hes Reverend Mitch Hescox. If we'll bow our heads, we'll go on into prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to gather together. Thank you for the sun, the moon, the stars. Thank you for the beautiful earth you have given us. And Lord, help us rectify and reconcile our hearts to taking care of your creation. And whether that creation is our neighbors or the injustices we see in America today, or even the the tiniest of little children that we need to protect um, from pollution. Please help us to be the, the shining example for your love and for your uh, care for us. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So um, we're going to go through a quick, quick review so everyone will know what to expect. I'm going to share my screen. And maybe this will work. Here we go. Can everybody see the screen? Here we go. Excellent. So um, this book club, we're going to start off with Pollution and the Death of Man um, by Francis Schaeffer. Uh, just so you know, this was one of the books that Mitch, when I started with EE, and Mitch is like, you got to read this book. And it is a great book. One of the reasons I love the book is it's short. So um, that'll leave us lots of opportunity to discuss and, and dive into the the topics of this. Well, so we just want to go over the schedule really quickly. We decided um, to sort of spread it out because as summer is, comes along and Fridays tend to be a little slower, we wanted to give plenty of space for people to do fun things on Friday um, besides showing us for book clubs. So here's the schedule. Um, Tori, did you send this out also? If not, we will send it out. Um, I know that we had a little bit of shock when we were thinking like, uh, like October. I'm like, we just, we just started summer. How could we be thinking about October? But we're hoping that this, uh, this schedule will give us a little more breathing room. We're just going to do the first six chapters in the book. Um, the, the book that we recommended on Amazon actually has a seventh chapter, but it was not written by Francis Schaefer. So uh, we're not going to cover that chapter, but we certainly encourage you to read it. And the reason we're not going to cover the chapter is because we didn't know what version of the book they might have. And you may not have that version with the seventh chapter. So just to remind everyone, we have ground rules and um, this is a community of grace and we offer these guidelines often referred to as ground rules to provide a framework to ensure dialogue and participation. Um, we want a place of openness and respectfulness and we want to be brave and we want to share and pray and learn and listen together. So we want folks to listen actively, speak from your own experience, create space for everyone to share, be aware of body language, respect confidentiality, own your intentions and your impact, expect unfinished business, both of discomfort and joy. And so now we will move into our first discussion, uh, pollution and the deaf man. Mitch, take it away. Well, thank you. It's good to be on again. And, um, you know, this is an interesting book. And, um, you know, Ben and I are going to talk about it in a little bit more in detail. But this book is probably one of the books that um, in my lifetime has probably been the most important book for understanding the theology of creation care. And just sort of background, if you don't know about it, it the book is really um, 
a response to an essay written by Lynn White Jr. in 1967, which basically blames all of Christianity for the ecological crisis. And in many ways, I think Dr. White was correct. I mean, the fact of the dualism that Christianity has gone is that our job was to, you know, the ultimate goal of many in Christianity was to be saved, to go to heaven. And, you know, for those of you who were with us last time, that's basically what I call in my own book, Good Friday Christians. The people that really, you know, want Jesus to die for their sins so they can go to an afterlife. But I think the kingdom of God in Christianity is much deeper than that. It's about doing the work of Christ, in fact, building his kingdom here on earth. And so a few years after that, and I think Ben probably knows more the story of I do about uh, Francis Schaeffer coming to the campus of Wheaton College and actually giving the series of lectures. This book was based on the six lectures that he gave at Wheaton. And we'll talk more about that later. But the one thing that I just like to throw out for our dis discussion today, you know, as when we talk and break into small groups and even questions that Ben and I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, what do you think about Lynn White's presupposition that the church has been responsible for much of the ecological crisis, that human beings had ultimate supremacy over the earth. There was the fact that we had the right to have dominion over all things. And what does that word dominion really mean? And I think that will be a good part of discussion. And then I think what Francis Schaeffer does, and I know this is skipping just a bit ahead a little bit, but the one comment that uh, I'd like to bring from ch chapter one is, and I will give you fair warning, if you haven't started the book out yet, this is not a politically correct written book. So, you know, the use of ban is in there. He uses the King James Bible. So, I mean, it was just written in his time and you have to take it for, you know, the time frame that it was written in. But, you know, he says the simple fact that, um, if man is not able to solve the, the ecological crisis, human beings won't be able to fish, which I believe. But he also says that if religion is the cause, if faith is the cause, then faith is the only way of having the earth be healed, paraphrasing his words. And I think those are the big things to talk about and to, and to think about the day as we begin this book study. But it really is in my opinion, and I'm going to open it up to Ben to be part of this discussion. Beth, I think it's just Ben and I are going to have a dialogue next. Is that correct? So I would like to introduce Ben Lowe. Um, ben Lowe, uh, among other things, was a staff member for EEN for some time. He also ran for Congress before that, which was really fun because I can remember the day we talked about it in his car on our way to Wheaton College. Should I run or not? And I said, what do you have to lose? And uh, I'm glad he chose to run because it was a remarkable experience. But then he was the first national organizer of Young Evangelicals for Climate Action and worked with EEN before he decided to, uh, you know, we have a whole bunch of these staff members that go off and work on their PhDs in higher education. And, uh, you know, but I think the real purpose was Ben just loves to fish. And if you don't know that, you know, that's Ben's passion. In fact, I think that's what you're, basically your PhD is working on, correct, is looking at fishing and adequate things um, in Africa. So Ben, I am so glad to be part of you. It's been a long time since we personally caught up. He's the author of many books and uh, co-author with Ron Siders of a couple others. So why don't you tell a little bit more about yourself and then we can, in the history of Wheaton and Dr. Schaefer, and then we could have a few minutes of dialogue before we turn it to questions and answers. Sure, thanks Mitch. It's a joy to be with you all, a joy to see some of you old friends and to reconnect with EEN. I miss my days at EEN, especially I think when I'm in my windowless graduate student office, crack, you know, cranking away on some data set, trying to run some analysis and on. I think, oh, I miss the days when I was with EEN out there getting stuff done. So I really appreciate the work that EEN is doing and this opportunity that we all have to reconnect here. Um, I'm originally from Singapore. Came to this country with my family when I was a teenager. Um, have been, grew up in the church, have been in the church my whole life. 
I'm an ordained minister with the Krishna Missionary Alliance now, which makes me a really odd duck in my Department of Wildlife Ecology and Conservation at the University of Florida, where I study the human dimensions of global environmental change. So I'm interested kind of in two aspects. One, as Mitch said, I'm obsessed with fish. And I think there is some connection there between being a fisher of fish and a fisher of people that ties all the way back to Christ and the Gospels. I haven't quite figured out how to articulate it yet, but it's there, so I'm claiming it. Um, I love fish in every form, whether eating, watching, studying, catching, keeping, all of it. Um, and so part of my research is on Lake Tanganyika in East Africa, where I look at, I study how human communities and fishing communities in particular are adapting to the declines and catches that are driven in part by climate change out there. Um, but then the other half of my dissertation shifts back and is uh, looking at the role of religion and in particular Christianity when it comes to engaging climate and environmental problems and offering solutions. So one of the projects I'm working on right now that I've been interacting with YECA a little bit about is uh, we're trying to quantify any, sh any generational shifts that might be taking place in people's attitudes and engagement around environmental issues in the United States. So we just finished a survey of uh, students at over 35 Christian campuses around the country and I'm immersed in that data set. Uh, I've been spending this whole week recoding it. So if I start twitching halfway through, that's why you can blame Excel and SPSS and all that other stuff for that. Anyway, maybe I'll, I'll stop there, but uh, it's great to be with you all. Ben, you know, you are a Wheaton alumni, and I think Wheaton has this proud history of sponsoring these lectures. You know. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Wheaton history involved in creation care and a little bit about how these lectures got started and then just talk about the book itself and what is this work meant to you? Well, I have to be very honest. Um, I wasn't around when the lectures happened. Um, so you, it's a great story for Wheaton. So you have to know part of the story you tell. <laughs> yeah, Wheaton, Wheaton has, um, and sometimes we can uh, also be very honest here. Sometimes we like to inflate our role in the Christian college community. We think ourselves of ourselves as being um, uh, one of the, the best institutions out there. The more I work with all these other Christian colleges, though, I think there are many excellent institutions out there. And um, one of the things that Lynn White Jr. was proposing in his paper was that we need to have more humility as it relates to the environment. And so maybe we can apply that. Um, I, as I would talk about Wheaton and I love Wheaton and I had a great experience there, I, I hope to talk about it with some humility and recognizing that we are but one of many institutions that have been contributing to these things. But Wheaton has um, in many ways uh, tried to help shape the, the theological imagination of the church and in particular of, of evangelical Christianity in America and worldwide. And, so it's gotten into a lot of different topics around ethics and faith and how we live that out, uh, both looking at God's word, but then also applying it to, the, to God's world and looking at what's going on in God's world around us. So that lecture series really comes out of that and is one of the manifestations of that passion and commitment at Wheaton. I would say though that um, it, was a, it took me a while before I realized that those lectures happen at Wheaton. Um, which I, and I had read the book before I realized that those lectures took place at Wheaton way before my time. And I think um, one of the lessons I learned from that is just because you have a, a heritage of caring or thinking about an issue uh, doesn't mean that automatically you're going to be particularly good on that. It doesn't mean that you're gonna, your leadership is going to continue. I think this is an issue that we have to continue learning and engaging and growing in. And um, I think like any of us as individuals, Wheaton as an institution needs to continue to do that too and is trying to continue to live in to um, the ideas that were shared on this campus through this lecture series. Now, one of the things that I always find very interesting in my own life and reading Francis Schaeffer is that he was one of the real founders of the moral majority movement. And it's very interesting to talk about that, you know, one of the preeminent theologians of the time was highly engaged with this ultra conservative um, political movement in the late 70s and 80s. But yet he wrote probably, as we just said earlier, the, the, uh, at least the seminal book on trying to drive Christianity 
back into caring about God's earth. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that, Ben? It's encouraging. It's a good reminder that the sometimes very partisan and political polarization that we struggle with in this country around some of these issues is not necessary. It's a product of our history. Uh, it's not a product of our, of, of our theological heritage or our current calling. And so that's one of the things that I think is, um, as a Christian, my faith gives me a lot of resources to engage on this issue because I can engage on it on a, on a level that's deeper than the political level. Uh, and that can often give folks from any political background an opportunity to reframe what has been so polarized and think about what does this mean for me as a person of faith, as a follower of Jesus in the world today? How does my relationship with the creator and the redeemer um, shape how I view these issues and how I perceive what's going on and then how I engage in the world and show up today. Yeah, I think that's an excellent comment. That, that one I think that we all need to be living into. And uh, I can remember, um, you know, part of the stories that I tell in the book that we first read was about, you know, leading a Bible study down in Harrisonburg, Virginia. We're just a blessed individual. I was talking and teaching on Colossians chapter one, um, where it says, you know, the whole earth was created by, for, and through Jesus Christ. And I talked about what that really means to us. If the earth is Jesus, doesn't it call us to be better responsibility of it? And the gentleman, when I sit down there at the table, um, said, you know, I've never understood this book and that passage to be talking about caring about God's creation. And I think that's one thing that we hope that this book of, of, of reading Francis Schaeffer and Pollution, the Death of Man, actually gives us sort of a, while it is, it's you know half a century old, it gives us a theological sort of foundation to talk about creation care. And especially, you know, one of the things that I love to do, and, and even in my more conservative uh, theologically bound um, evangelical friends, you really can't challenge the thoughts of Francis Schaeffer. You know, as I said, he was a founder of the moral majority. I mean, he's as conservative as you get, folks, but yet he wrote this really primary text on caring for God's creation. Um, ben, just share a few more things before we start taking questions about what you think of that and this book in general, what it meant, has meant to you in your life. And, uh, you know, you're the author of several books. And uh, how do you relate it to your own work, your own life, and where you're at today? Oof. Um, well, it's, it's good to know that the, the work that we're doing today has a long tradition in our faith community, that this, this isn't something new that's being invented. It goes back to someone like Francis Schaeffer, and it goes back much, much further than that as, as other our writers and, and um, historians have helped us to chronicle. So that's very gratifying. I think, you know, as I, as I um, think over at my time at Wheaton, which, which was very good, and we, we did do a lot of environmental work on campus, and I think they're still engaging there. One of the fun things that we were able to do is we brought Sir John Houghton to campus for a conference that involved, that EEN helped to sponsor, uh, and that involved students from a bunch of other different Christian uh, universities around the country and that was a really um, that was a really powerful time for folks like me it helped me engage around climate change uh, by hearing from somebody who shared my faith and was a leader in climate science as a discipline um, and I did that for a lot of other folks and a lot has come out of that so I'm really grateful for that I think one of the a couple of the takeaways I I have from books like Pollution and the Death of Man and my experiences at Wheaton is that these aren't just, you know, as we all know, these aren't just environmental issues. For us, there's, there's a very real and significant aspect of it that this is, these are discipleship issues. And the reason that the church in America has often been perceived and too often has been um, not supportive of environmental concerns and engagement has been a failure in our discipleship. And so this is really like with any other issue, uh, we're seeking to be faithful to God here. And, and so that connects to the, the other point I wanted to bring up, which is that um, in my graduate work, 
I'm in, I straddle a few different departments at the university. I, I'm in an interdisciplinary field of study. And so on one hand, I straddle departments that are very focused on wildlife ecology and conservation. So they have more of a biocentric or an ecocentric approach, which is the fancy ethical term for saying that we care a lot about the non-human species and about biodiversity and things like that. Um, sometimes at the expense of caring about human well-being, you know, we prioritize uh, non-human species. And then I'm also in a bunch of natural resource spaces where we view um, the environment as resources for humans to exploit for our well-being. And so that's much more of an anthropocentric viewpoint where we put humans at the center of everything. And I think what, um, what Francis Schaeffler helps remind us of and what we can offer the world today and the church today is that we're not primarily called to put humans at the center and we're not primarily called to put non-human species at the center. Really, we're supposed to be taking a theocentric view of these issues. So we put God at the center. And when God is actually at the center of our worldview, of how we orient and live our lives, then all these other pieces can be properly oriented around God. And that's the only way we, we avoid some of the idolatry and the um, really some of the, the bad and unfortunate practices and reputation that Christians have had around these issues. So maybe I'll, I'll leave it with that. Ben, that was absolutely purpose. And, you know, we haven't scripted this at all. But the final question I have for us to start thinking about as a group and maybe to respond to when we take questions is right from Francis Schaeffer's book. Uh, he puts it this way, what people do about their ecology, ecology depends on what they think about themselves in relationship to the things around them. And I think that's really true is who's at the center? Are we at the center? Is God at the center? And what does that mean in your own life if we put God first? And so with that, um, Ben and I are free to take a few questions for, and then Beth will, or somebody will cut us off and tell us when to go to small groups. But I just wanna say, um, a special thank you to Ben. I have not seen Ben for a couple of years. He had no idea what questions I was going to ask him today. But, uh, you know, Ben has been a brother to me for 12 years now, at least. And uh, I mean, I just really love Ben Lowe. He's been a great guy and all sorts of stories on walking from uh, West Virginia to DC together a long time ago and uh, hanging out at Wheaton. So Ben, thank you so much for being part of our book club and you're welcome back anytime. Thanks. Oh, it's, it's an absolute joy. And uh, since Mitch did bring up that walk, you should all know that me being the young whippersnapper thought, I don't need to prepare for this. I'll be fine. And Mitch totally outwalked me. I think it was like day three and I was like riding in the minivan because. I, <laughs> uh, I love that. So we have Tori is, um, you know, uh, thrown out that we'll take questions. So, um, but I'm just really curious. Um, I mean, clearly you are a, a deeply committed man of God and, and it is so refreshing. And honestly, I just want to compliment you on the, the, the conversation about how we need to be theocentric. I mean, that I can't even think of a better way to put it. I mean, it just, you just laid it out so perfectly for us that, you know, we just have to remind ourselves and in the environment where we are, where we see, we see people yelling about not wearing masks and, and COVID, um, what do you think are, how do we, how do we show up with a theocentric uh, perspective and convince people that's where we need to be? <laughs> that's a really good and very big question, Beth. Um, I think there are a lot of directions one could go. Uh, and, and unpacking this. And hopefully this is something that uh, this group can continue to discuss over time as we work through this book. But I think one of the, the real, there are a couple of real opportunities here and that maybe I'll touch on now. One is that um, it's that we don't, um, let me think about how to put this right. I have these ideas swirling in my head right now. <laughs> um, but the um we we can have hope because god is at the center not us we we are called to be faithful but it's really god who we're trusting to care for things and it's really god who we're trusting to bring all things back together and, and make all things right and so that allows us to to look at very painful uh and very dark things and experience and go through these things without losing our hope in 
God's ultimate faithfulness. Because at the end of the day, and I think COVID has helped to make this, uh, help remind us of this, we're just very weak, very fallible, very limited creatures. As much as, as powerful as we have become, at the end of the day, we still, you know, we, we still need humility, which is something uh, Lynn White Jr. was calling us to that I think Schaefer would agree with. We're, we're, we're still part of creation. And we have to look to God for that. And that's an, that's an extraordinary comfort for me as I do this work, knowing that it doesn't ride on me or doesn't rest on me to get it all done. That's awesome. That's, that's a great perspective, right? And I think um, for me, a lot of times when I'm about to have to have a conversation that might be a challenge, I, if, if, I, if I can remember, then I try to make this a practice is just say a quick prayer, Holy Spirit, give me the words, right? Um, as we face people yelling about personal freedoms and, and masks and things like that. And being in Florida, of course, you know, you've got a real uh, challenge right now with the state of Florida. We're cer certainly praying for a change of events down there. So it doesn't look like we have any questions today. I think Larry had one, if you could, uh, we oh. could skip to him. I thought I'm trying to raise his hand up a minute ago. So oh, Larry, okay, I great. think you're Thanks, on. Mitch. No, I didn't write it, I'm sorry. I, I can't seem to write fast enough. Uh, I had I had two questions. Uh, ben, we're we're uh, friends on Facebook, so we're obviously very close. Uh, but <laughs> what, what is the Aw, Aw Sable Institute? That's my my first question, and then my second one is is more complex. This morning and recently, uh, I've been interviewing people and talking with people about race relations, and in terms of thinking about the environment. This, this, you, you know, I wrote down what you said. We have hope because God is at the center. And you said some more things, but then you, it doesn't ride on me to get it done. And when I think about race uh, relations, I mean, that is, that, that is almost verbatim what I've gotten from several leaders. So uh, I wonder if you might think about racial relations and environmental stewardship, because so many people who are poor end up living in, you know, near the refinery or downstream from whatever, or, you know, in Austin, we pushed everybody who was black and brown over to one side of town, and then they built tank farms over there. So, uh, you know, it's not, it, 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 it's not unrelated. And so I, I, any reflections you have on that, I'd appreciate. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as a person of color, um, I've been really heavily involved in some of the conversations and, and, um, and efforts that are going on right now. It's been a very heavy season for a lot of our communities, but it's also been a very hopeful season because we've been, we've been waiting for opportunities for not just communities of color to engage around and recognize the issues that need to be addressed, but for all of the country and really our society at large to be ready to face some very painful and hard things. Uh, these are uncomfortable things. In some ways I think of it, um, I, I, I want to be careful using this analogy, but in some ways it's, it's like a bit of getting over an addiction. You know, you, you realize that you've been, you've been dependent on and attached to bad, way, bad habits and, and bad practices in the past, and so you need to break those, but they're not easy things to break. They take a lot of work and they're painful and, you know, your experience of freedom as you're engaging it and it's worthwhile and it brings greater health the more you stick with it but it's a long journey of breaking free from these things that have really had a hold on our hearts and minds in the past. And so I think, yeah, there's a, obviously a lot of connections between environmental issues and race and racism and, and all of these things. I've seen a lot of really um, encouraging connections. I know one of YCA's steering committee members, Karina Newsom, uh, was an instrumental leader in the Black Birders day uh, that a Blackbird is weak that happened recently and has been uh, interviewed by everybody like you just google her name and you'll see all sorts of hits everywhere she's uh, been able to represent YUCA very well I think in connecting the issue of race to creation and caring for creation so I'm really grateful for that the um you asked about the Osabo Institute I'll just say very briefly that along with EEN are these are two of the oldest creation care organizations in the United States and have a long history of working together on different things. Our Sabo really focuses, and actually Dale is one of our, um, our faculty reps with our Sabo, so he can tell you more about it too, but 
Um, it uh, is based in, on a campus in northern lower Michigan, a beautiful part of the country. And it has a number of different programs, but really focused a lot on conservation, education, and research. So we offer courses during the summer, for instance, for students from any university around the country too, uh, but a lot of the Christian universities like Wheaton send students there to take courses in environmental fields that their campuses might not have enough students to enroll an entire class in. But when you pull it all together, then it, uh, then it makes it work. And so I think really when I think of Asabo, I'm reminded of um, a quote that I love by Wendell Berry. And I am I'm absolutely butchering and paraphrasing it here, but it's basically you can't practice virtue without skill. And so if you really care, or you think caring for creation is a really important thing to do, then you actually have to, you know, at some level, you have to develop the skills to care for creation well. We can't just wish it to be better. We've done things that uh, are complicated and we have to undo some of those things. And so Asawa helps people um, with the skills to care for creation. And, and Larry, I want to go back and, and maybe flush out just a little bit of what I think Ben said. And Ben, you can jump in if I'm wrong. It's not that it's totally up to God to solve the environmental crisis, nor is it up to God to solve the racism crisis. It's up to us to be empowered by God in knowing that we're not alone in this journey. And I think that's the center of it is just like in me in the Wesleyan tradition, uh, one of the questions at ordination is, do you expect to be made perfect by love? And the answer is yes, by God's grace. And I think that's what we're talking about is that we have God to depend on to help us, to guide us through it so we're not alone. But we're certainly totally believe that we have a responsibility to both to work on the issue of systemic racism in the United States and systemic pollution, which Larry, you're absolutely right, is that uh, people of color are the most severely impacted without a doubt. Um, so uh, Beth, Tori, I'll turn it back to you. Is there time for any more questions or are we ready to go into a small group? We've got one more question um, that I think we'll, we'll entertain and then we'll hop over to small groups. Uh, when Ben finished answering this question, Tori, if you'll take over and give everyone the, the, the you know, things they have to do about the small groups, great. All right, so um, here we go, Ben. What is your view on engaging people who are blind to truth that is based on facts and focused on what they feel is true, not based on any science or facts, and therefore cannot be reasoned with using statistics or data? Great. Well, I'll um, address that in the next minute. And once that's fixed, we'll move. <laughs> that's, a really, <laughs> that's a really good question. I'm afraid that I'll, I, once again, I can, I can start offering some thoughts and then hopefully it'll be something that continues to be unpacked. Um, well, we, we actually have, and you know, in the social science uh, research now, we actually have lots of um, great evidence that statistics and data and facts are necessary but not sufficient for helping people to care and engage. That really what, what runs a lot deeper than that are values. And values can be really hard to shift, but as one of our dear friends, Kat, Dr. Catherine Hale, the climate scientist is, is fond of saying, everybody already has all the values that they need to care about these issues. We just have to help connect these issues with the values that they already have. And so I think that's one of the reasons I value the work that EEN does so much and our other organizations like that is because it helps communicate these issues in ways that are accessible, that connect in with people's lives that make sense. Uh, and that's a really important step. So I think, you know, we, we have to continue as Christians. We believe that all truth is God's truth and we have to be people of truth and we have to uh, continue to, to engage in good science and, and understanding how this world works and how we can shape it better and all of that. Um, but we don't, need, we don't need everybody to be scientists in order to care. Um, and that's, I think, maybe where I'll leave you with, other than to say that um, completely affirm what Mitch was, the qualifications Mitch was um, uh, sharing a little bit ago. And that's one of the, I think that's one of the, it's a responsibility to care for God's creation, but it's also a tremendous gift and opportunity and it's something that continues to move me very regularly that, that God being who God is um, would still choose to work with us to do his work in this world is incredible. I can't think of a better way to spend my life than to join with the God in the mission that he is doing in the world today to redeem, to reconcile, to restore all things. 
through his blood shed on the cross. What a great gift, even if we face heavy times that we get to participate in. Amen. Thank you, Ben. What a beautiful note to end on. Um, so thank you, Mitch and Ben, for this fantastic discussion, especially to Ben for joining us. He was actually on a YACA call last night with us, so he just continues to support and give his time, and we're so thankful. Ben and I did not work here at the same time, but I definitely stand on his shoulders, and it's just been great to get to know him. See you, everyone. Thanks, Ben. Thanks.